Welcome back to Anime Lockdown. I know everybody's still excited from the Disco Tech panel. We have a lot more fun coming here. Right uh, up next is the History of Mecha panel with the uh, duo from NOS Anime. Welcome back to Anime Lockdown. Hi there. Thank you so much for having us. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second panel. Again, we are NOS Anime. Uh, we're an Orlando-born panel group dedicated to bringing high-quality, well-researched, and informative panels to conventions. Now, this one here is the first panel in a series of them focused on the history of one of anime's most renowned genres, mecha. Now, for most of the members of our group, and we suspect most of you in the audience, mecha anime represents a foundational element to our interest in anime. This central status of mecha within our fandom piqued our interest in how such a genre came to be within our modern world over the past 50 plus years of its history. This resultant curiosity led us to posit the concept of this panel, but as one might imagine with a genre lasting over half a century, we quickly realized a single panel wouldn't really afford you guys in the audience much more than a catalog of notable programs. As a result, we've decided to divide and conquer throughout the course of the panel series. So for this first presentation, we're gonna highlight the beginnings of the mecha genre from its inception with the black and white limited animation of Tetsujin 28, all the way to the eventual genre divide perpetrated by Mobile Suit Gundam at the end of the 1970s. For the core of our presentation, we're gonna showcase seminal mecha series of the period that represents milestones, whether they be by virtue of first to do so or through dominating the popular imagination of the time period. But we don't just want to give you a list of shows and dates. Nothing in a culture exists within a vacuum. So throughout the panel, we're also gonna highlight various historical, economic, and societal factors that played a role in shaping mecha anime during these formative years. By the time we finish, you should have both a good understanding of the forebearers of mecha history and a better concept for how it, how it all came to be. Now, a couple important things to note. Uh, firstly, we do have some time set aside at the end for questions. So we'll just kind of take those uh, through the Twitch chat there at the end as the current plan. Also an important factor on a couple of the clips, a couple of our early black and white clips do have some very low audio. So you may need at least for those just to cut the volume up. The others all appear to be in good order. So with that out of the way, it's probably going to behoove us here to explain exactly what we mean when we say that we're gonna be discussing mecha anime to start with. Now, while most of us think about giant robots when we say mecha, and this is definitely what we're thinking in the panel, there is more to it than that. At its core, mecha is just an abbreviated form of the word mechanical in Japanese. Depending on the medium, it can refer to different computers, cars, weapons, robots, and even industrial mechanical equipment. Now, as you might imagine, Though anime doesn't tend to be so broad, uh, imagine just how disappointing it would be to get an entire TV show about like printing presses or something. So when it comes to anime, mecha generally refers to just advanced vehicles and robots. Now we're gonna leave out fancy vehicles for obvious reasons, but we do still need to narrow it down when it comes to robots. When it comes to robot mecha in Japan, the style ranges from autonomous thinking robots to ones that are piloted like a jet fighter and in size from that of a normal person to things big enough to wield galaxies like shuriken. But as we're here to just specifically discuss giant robots, we're gonna be eliminating smaller human-sized robots, cyborgs, and shows with heroes in form-fitting powered armors. So we won't be worrying ourselves with things like Astro Boy, Cyborg 009, or Bubblegum Crisis. As far as we're concerned, mecha as we'll be discussing it need to be at least bigger than a man. This is our most important descriptor as our second one leads us into an ultimately gray area. That second one is that the robot in some way, shape or form is dependent on a person to function in whatever capacity it's intended to, whether that be for fighting, construction, etc. And lastly, a giant robot needs to feature prominently in any show that we're gonna call a mecha anime. Uh, this is important because if we considered every show with the appearance of a giant robot to be in our mecha anime list, then our list could double or more. So it's ultimately these things, size, dependency, and giant robot centrality that are the determinant factors for what we'll be considering mecha anime for this panel. 
Now, with this out of the way, it's time to get into the history itself. But before we jump into the first actual giant robot show in 1963, we need to get a better understanding of what was going on in the culture it was coming into. While animation had been part of the Japanese artistic discourse prior to the 1960s and had influenced the creative minds behind the first giant robot anime, to grasp a picture of Japan beforehand really demands stepping back to the end of World War II. So in 1945 in August, Imperial Japan declared its surrender to the Allies and was left with an uncertain future. The resultant Allied occupation was an intensive liberalizing period for Japan with the foundation of a new constitution that practically forbade to Japan to engage in war with Article 9. This far left swing wasn't to last though, as the Cold War began and the United States began to view Japan as a democratic bulwark against the rise of communism in East Asia. The resurgence of conservative ideals in Japan in the 1950s was encouraged by the United States as being too liberal was considered a slippery slope into Soviet influence. The early 1950s conservative political party, the liberal party of Yoshida Shigeru here on the left, dispersed the liberalizing factor in Japan through a focus on rebuilding the Japanese economy by supporting business. Shigeru's rival there on the right, Kishi Nobusuke, he came in and crippled the Liberal Party from within and formed the even more conservative Democratic Party, which looked to reestablish Japan as a direct player on the international stage. There was fear, however, that these divided conservative political parties would be too weak to withstand liberal competition. And this led to those two parties being combined into the Liberal Democratic Party that we have today that even nowadays dominates Japanese politics. Now, the Liberal Democratic Party's hegemony under the guiding hand of Kishi Nobusuke would very quickly see a crucial pair of events take place in 1960 that would set the foundation for the modern Japan where we would see the rise of giant robot animation. Now, the first of these events was the protests surrounding the reconsideration of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. The proposed changes enraged the public, and they led to some monumental demonstrations. While Nobusuke used political loopholes to pass the new treaty, the protests didn't wane. Even though they hadn't won, the protesters continued to cause commotion and embarrassed the Nobusuke government until he was forced to step down and he was replaced by Ikeda Hayato, a disciple of Shigeru. Now, Hayato took a 180, turned sharply against those pro-war policing reforms that Nobusuke had envisioned, and he focused solely on a program to double Japanese household income within 10 years. Absolutely anything having to do with international conflict or security treaties was put to the back burner, and all the efforts of the Japanese government moved into growing the economy. In addition to those security treaty protests, the other notable event of 1960, the Miike miner strike, was another factor into how Japan would function economically in the next decades. The strike by the Miike coal miners would eventually prove unsuccessful, but importantly, it proved to be a significant embarrassment to the new Hayato government with its emphasis on breeding household success via economic success. Businesses and governments um, and the government responded by trying to mitigate these disturbances with the solidifying of lifetime guarantees of employment. And that was a major factor in the miraculous economic growth of the following years. So here is where we're left off in the early 1960s in Japan. Japan's possible turn toward a new level of international involvement led by a conservative movement was stymied. And in its place, what remained was a country largely inconsiderate of international politics unless it benefited domestic economic growth. In this new Japan, there were three treasures whose ownership was a sign that your family had made it. They were the refrigerator, the dishwasher, and very importantly for us, the television. Now, there were really few channels available at first, but by 1960, 54% of households owned a television. And overall, between 1958 and 1963, competition between advertisers increased so dramatically that available advertising money to sponsor programs quadrupled. This booming period, though short to last, would bring us the first 30-minute television anime of all time with Astro Boy. Now, this is one of those shows that concerns Mecha in the broader sense, but we do want to mention some things that are important from it. Robots that are gigantic in size do appear in Astro Boy, 
such as the character Garon from episode 19. Now, Garon is easily classic giant robot size, but him and other sizable from robots from Astro Boy are generally fully or partially autonomous, and they function more so as monster of the week villains rather than established features of the show itself. The second item to consider, though, is a lot more important. Other animation companies, you see, were keeping a really keen eye on Astro Boy, and once they noted its success, they sought to quickly copy it. The result of this competition brings us to our first true mecha anime entry with Tetsujin 28 Go. Premiering on October 20th, 1963, Tetsujin 28 Go was the progenitor series for mecha anime. The story of Tetsujin 28 centers around Shotaro, the son of Dr. Kaneda, a military researcher who was in the process of creating experimental giant robots for Japan in World War II. But when Dr. Kaneda died near the end of the war, it was thought that his robots went with him. But when prototypes 26 and 27 began being utilized for crime, Shotaro seeks out the legendary 28th prototype and chooses to use it for good instead of evil. So in this show, our titular robot, he was controlled via a remote instead of through piloting via an internal cockpit, which is what we're more used to in today's shows. This 96 episode series, based on a wildly successful comic from the previous decade, aired over nearly three years in Japan and was produced by a company called TJC, which up until this point had done work purely in advertising animation. There is a fun rumor from folks around the time that Tetsujin 28 only went into production in case Mushi Pro, who made Astro Boy, burned down and freed up its coveted time slot. And while the rumor is likely nothing more than that, Tetsujin 28 certainly did have a lot in common with its cartoon rival. Just like Astro Boy, another anime from this period, the method for production was quite different from the production committee system we're used to in today's anime. The style pioneered with Astro Boy was to have the animation company make the product and then look for buyers to fund what they had made and to fund Born the Future. These buyers could be advertising conglomerates looking for a program to fill a segment they had purchased on a network, or, for example, in the case of Tetsujin 28, a large business looking for a new way to advertise its product. Now, again, I know this sounds bad, but as you may have heard in that opening animation, the first and last lines of that opening song have nothing to do with giant crime-fighting robots, but rather it proudly chants the name of its sponsor, Glico Candy Company, the creators of Pocky. So with the backing money of Glico, Tetsujin 28 was able to be made, but not without what we would consider today some serious shortcuts. Let's take a look at this battle clip, for example. Now that choppily animated scene may seem janky to us, 
But for productions of its time period, this was the only viable method for the shows to be created and shown weekly while remaining within an acceptable budget. This style, which we call limited animation, was first used to notable effect by Osama Tezuka for Astro Boy, but it wasn't actually Tezuka's innovation, as some may say. What Tezuka had really done, though, was to set a particular cost bar that anime needed to meet in order to be desirable for advertisers. As a result, the only way to animate a show was to use limited animation techniques, like minimizing the frames per second, lingering on stills, pan shots, stock footage, that sort of thing. Now, any of you familiar with Japanese anime will recognize that some of these techniques are still used in the modern day. Luckily for all of us, though, Tetsujin 28 was successful, and tie-in products did well. It was also a particularly good time for Tetsujin 28, as the advent of the 1964 Tokyo Olympics saw a major increase in television sales. So as the show aired, more and more kids were able to watch and draw in the ratings. When the show finished in 1966, there weren't any giant robot shows on the horizon to replace it. Part of the reason was that the producers and animators thought that Tetsujin 28 had tapped all potential giant robot, uh, giant robot potential, and they didn't just want to make stuff that would seem derivative, which is quite funny for us to think about these days. Now, the next instance of a central giant robot fitting our descriptors doesn't pop up until a film from 1969 called Flying Phantom Ship. Released on July 20th, 1969, Flying Phantom Ship was the first feature-length anime film that featured a giant robot, and the first one in color, no less. Uh, this film, produced by Toei Animation, tells the story of Hayato Arashiyama, a teenager that saves the president of the Kuroshio Drinks Company from a car wreck. Now, Kuroshio's president is haunted by a ghostly apparition of the Flying Phantom Ship's captain. A few days later, the giant robot Golem, declaring itself to be sent by the ship's captain, attacks Hayato's city, and through the rampaging destruction, Hayato discovers the dark secrets of the Kuroshio Drink Company and its Boa Juice soft drink. So, let's be really blunt here, this is not an Oscar contending film. The story is nuts, and the animation is one hell of a thing to put it nicely. That titular giant robot, Golem, is interesting for a couple of reasons, though. First and foremost, the mecha designer and animator for Golem was none other than Hayao Miyazaki of Studio Ghibli fame. And second, the giant robot actually changes color from the trailer, where it's bright red, into the drab blue that you see in the actual film. The film itself is also kind of an interesting cultural gem, as it was one of the first anime films to be dubbed into Russian and screened in Soviet cinemas. Now, we couldn't get any definitive answer on the reasoning behind this, but its negative portrayal of capitalist companies probably didn't hurt its chances in the Soviet Union. Now, the story itself brings up an interesting trend in Japan beginning in the late 60s and early 70s. The creator, Shoto Ishinomori of Cyborg 009 fame, was tapping into the beginnings of a popular movement wherein people no longer just looked at big business as endlessly innovative and supportive of the prosperity of the nation, but as for-profit enterprises that, would, that were out for their own bottom line. Not that this would lead to total dystopian views of business within Japanese art, but the heyday of the glorious future encouraged by business and seen in futuristic shows like Astro Boy had certainly gone by the wayside. Three years after filming uh, The Flying Phantom Ship, a pair of shows would premiere with one of those being a kind of a footnote to history and the other being the beginning of Mecca's first franchise. We'll start with that first show, which is Astro Ganger. Now, premiering on October 4th, 1972, Astro Ganger represented a selection of firsts for Mecca anime. The story itself revolves around Earth being attacked by aliens called the Blasters. Professor Hoshi creates a giant robot known as Astroganger from a piece of living metal brought by his wife from her home planet of Konseros. After they both pass away, it's left to their son Kantaro to fuse with this giant robot and save the Earth. So Astroganger was not just the first mecha anime of the 1970s, but also the first mecha TV show to be animated in color. Additionally, we should consider Astroganger and his boy companion for a moment. Astroganger represents what one might call a transitional phase in design for a giant robot. The mech itself was sentient and had unique facial expressions, but in order for it to function regularly, Kantaro had to fuse with it. 
this isn't done with a cockpit or anything, but instead Kantara uses a special pendant and becomes one with Astroganger. When fused, we don't see Kantaro anymore. It's merely that Astroganger himself becomes fully functional to fight. While Astroganger had some popularity, the depiction of its robots and its merchandising potential reflected an older style, similar to that of Tetsujin 28, while its successors would move towards the more modern marketing method through toys. But in the long run, Astroganger would be overshadowed by the next Mecha show to premiere in Japan, which would have major implications for Mecha's history. That show is one you guys are probably familiar with. We're going to look at Mazinger Z. ロゲネの城スーパーロボットマジンガーゼット無敵の力は僕らのために正義の心パイルダーオー飛ばせ鉄剣ロケットパンチ未だ出すんだプレストファイヤー So Mazinger Z scraped in right at the tail end of 1972, premiering on December 3rd. This show, based on a comic by the famous mangaka Go Nagai, added a lot of innovations to the giant robot toolkit and was central to mecha anime's next big step into history. The story itself revolves around the evil Dr. Hell, who plans to take over the world with his Kikaiju, led by his lieutenants, Baron Ashura and Count Brocken. Opposing him is the Photon Research Laboratory, whose Dr. Kabuto creates the Mazinger Z robot from the special Super Alloy Z. After he dies, his grandson, Kabuto Koji, must master the ability to pilot Mazinger Z and save the world. The key innovation for Mazinger Z, story-wise, was that the titular robot was piloted by Koji, instead of being a sentient robot or something controlled by external remote. Koji would actually jump into his piloter craft and dock into the head of the Mazinger in order to fight. Along with this change, we also see the removal of pupils in the eyes of the giant robot. This change helps you as the viewer see Mazinger more as a suit of armor instead of a robot with its own personality. And on top of this new piloting aspect, Mazinger Z was just more exciting by leaps and bounds when it comes to seeing the robot in action. Unlike Tetsujin 28 or Astroganger, who mostly just threw or punched stuff to death, Mazinger Z used bombastic attacks, ranging from beams to acid breath to the classic rocket punch. Aiding in this new level of colorful action was an innovation in the anime industry that was being used on giant robot shows for the first time in the 1970s, and that's xerography. Now, xerography is short for Xerox photography, and it boils down to the process which allows an artist's sketches to be copied directly from paper to a cell for later animation. This new method allowed for quicker preparation of main cells and allowed for the rapid shrinking or enlarging of images, both of which help reduce the time required to animate. Now, while cost-saving techniques are still utilized liberally at this point, this technology, alongside a significant influx of new creative talent that occurred in the late 60s, meant that shows like Mazinger Z could really be fully animated for the first time. The new ability to directly copy sketches also allowed artists to move away from the more simple rounded characters and movements seen in the previous TV anime of the decade and to more distinctive drawings which helped bring more complex hero robots and their monstrous villains to life. Along with this better look in full animation also came the full blown dive that mecha anime would take into the arms of the toy industry. Now, that isn't to say that toys for previous mecha shows didn't exist in the 1970s, uh, but, sorry, but in the 1970s, toy companies truly began in earnest to join with anime projects at the production level in order to reap the reward of selling associated toys. The big innovation with toys and Mazinger in particular was with zinc alloy die-cast toys. 
these heavy metal-based robot toys were sold under the Chogokin brand by Poppy, who would later be bought out by Bandai, and they were wildly successful. For Poppy, the show turned out to be, in essence, a 30-minute advertisement for their product. In the end, this first big success with Mazinger really solidified the system that would be the predominant method for creating robot anime over the course of the next few decades. In this system, amongst a selection of companies engaged in the production, the foremost would often be a toy company who would reap the benefits of associated toy sales. As we'll see, this symbiosis between anime and toy company would eventually be taken even further as the 70s went along. Now, importantly for us to consider with this toy boom, though, is the strong middle class base that had come to exist in Japan by the 1970s. This base of households with disposable income enough to purchase toys for their children was vital to the entire trend even becoming plausible. All of this was the result of that national policy of economic growth spearheaded by the Liberal Democratic Party beginning in 1960, which had produced fruitful results for Japan. In addition to general growth being strong, the rugged protections for lifetime employment set in place after the conflicts of 1960 also played a part, as the effects of economic struggles in the 1970s, like the various energy crises, had their potential bite on the Japanese workforce dulled. This meant that these economic downturns failed to hurt the Japanese economy to the fullest extent, and so sales for secondary goods, such as toys, could continue to steadily rise. Now, the next two series we're going to note include a new element previously unseen in mecha anime that would become a staple through to the modern day, and that's combining robots. Now, somewhat like our previous two entries, the first one we'll discuss has largely, largely fallen by the wayside in the mecha anime discourse, while the other became mecha's second franchise. That first series is Zero Tester. Uh, this series premiered on October 1st, 1973, and its claim to fame is being the first series with a giant robot composed of a group of smaller vehicles. The story of Zero Tester centers on Professor Tachibana and his test pilots who fly state-of-the-art tester vehicles against an alien race threatening the Earth known as the Arminoids. So as we noted, this TV series is the first of its kind to feature a combining giant robot made up of separate machines as opposed to a pre-built unit. This, as far as we can tell, is the Zero Tester robot itself doing something to a very giant spiked ball, what we do not know. Despite being the first of its kind, though, Zero Tester has really suffered the fate of Astroganger and for the most part remains forgotten to time. Perhaps the best thing Zero Tester really affords us, though, is the chance to look back at a show that had a profound influence on robot anime throughout the 1970s, and this is Thunderbirds. Now, Thunderbirds dealt with a rich philanthropist who creates a secret organization dedicated to using high-tech vehicles to save people across the world. Thunderbirds, however, was not Japanese, nor was it even animated. It was, in fact, a British puppet show. Regardless of its origins, Thunderbirds came to Japan at a pivotal moment to influence the artist who would eventually move on to mecha anime in the 70s. The period of the later 60s when Thunderbirds was playing on Japanese TV corresponded to a significant boom in interest surrounding military vehicle models from World War II. Thunderbirds' incredibly detailed miniatures used to shoot the vehicle sequences tapped into this zeitgeist and first influenced live action tokusatsu shows like Ultraman before becoming part of the mecha anime repertoire. Now, the, that second mecha series to come out in Japan at the same time would also take a stab at the combining robot gimmick, and in its case, proved to be substantially more successful than Zero Tester. This new anime was the first mecha entry from 1974, Get a Robo. Get the 
つになれば」「ひとつの正義は百万パワー」Get a Robo first aired April 4th, 19th, its predecessor. The story of Get a Robo centers on the emergence of the dinosaur empire from beneath the earth, which uses amalgam robot dinosaur beast to try and conquer the planet. Opposing them is the Sao Tome Research Institute, who, after losing their prototype Get a Robo in the initial attack, scrounge up a team consisting of Rio Nagare, Hayato Jin, And Musashi Tomoe to pilot the true combat worthy Geta Robo in order to save the Earth. Now, Geta Robo was created based off a manga by Ken Ishikawa that interestingly came out a few days after episode one of the TV show. Somewhat like Mazinger Z before it, Geta Robo may not have been the first to do its particular gimmick, but it ends up being the one that's remembered. What Geta Robo did right was to generally be more fun. Colorful and spectacular.、Uh, Get a Robo could take on three separate forms with their own particular speciality for each、uh, Get a One for aerial combat, Get a Two for land and underground combat, and Get a Three for underwater combat. Now, if you are wondering whether you should think about Thunderbirds again with this, you would be right. One of the key features of the five vehicles in Thunderbirds was that they each specialized in a particular area. Thunderbird 1 was the aerial unit, Thunderbird 4 the submersible, but none of them did actually have an underground feature to them. Have no fear though, because Thunderbirds did feature a secondary vehicle, the Jet Mole, which did underground boring work. This might seem like a bit of a stretch, but it's important to note that for whatever reason, the Jet Mole was incredibly popular in Japan and far exceeded its popularity elsewhere. So, while both Zero Tester and Get a Robo look heavily back to Thunderbirds for their core features, Get a Robo just created a better product that proved more in line with what children of Japan in the 1970s were after in terms of content. But how well did Get a Robo's new gimmick play out for the ever important toy industry? While it would seem that Get a Robo would be the progenitor for transforming robot toys in Japan, there was a bit of a hiccup here. When you see the combining of the Getter machines to form Getter Robo, you don't get a clean, concise transformation sequence as seen in later TV shows. Instead, Getter Robo just kind of magically morphs as the machines come together. Consequently, while toys sold well for Getter Robo, they didn't replicate exactly what was seen on screen and subsequently missed out on the opportunity for TV show to toy synergy. And as you'll see a little later, though, this issue would be rectified in future series. In the interim, though, we have to jump to another series with a set of firsts. This new series aired later that year on September 8th, 1974, and it's Great Mazinger. Now, this is the sequel to Mazinger Z and tells the story of the orphan Tetsuya Tsurugi, who takes control of the new Great Mazinger robot after Kabuto Koji leaves for the US. Assisting him is Koji's father, Dr. Kenzo Kabuto, and his adoptive sister, Jun Hono, as they do battle against the new threat of the world from the Mycenaean Empire. Now, purely discussing the plot of Great Mazinger highlights its primary achievement, being the first mecha anime sequel. Mecha shows up until this point had been one and done affairs, but Mazinger Z, Get a Robo, and later series would become foundations for franchises that would see sequels and spin offs. Great Mazinger also set the tone for sequels that would continue for most iterations of mecha shows down the line, with the new robot being related to but stronger than its predecessors and faced off against ever more dangerous foes. <clears throat> but beyond just its sequel status, Great Mazinger was also the first series to feature a crossover event with another mecha show. Though keep in mind, the original Mazinger Z had Mecha's first ever crossover event at all with Mecha,、uh, sorry, Mazinger Z versus Devilman. In the case of Great Mazinger, that crossover event was its, its own predecessor in Mazinger Z versus the General of Darkness. 
in the long run, these crossover events ultimately meant little to nothing for the main storylines of the respective shows, but they were very fun and generally well-received in their time. Now, our next mecha anime series to premiere in Japan is one filled with a selection of firsts in terms of both its plot and development, while also being a really good opportunity to look into the liberalizing nature of giant robot anime storytelling in the 1970s. We're going to take a look at Brave Riding. Brave Raideen premiered on April 4th, 1975, and it tells the story of Akira Hibiki, who's called upon by the mystic giant robot Raideen as he's descendant of the legendary people of Mu and the only one who can pilot it. Akira must work together with Raideen against the demon empire and their fossil beasts, who've awoken after 12,000 years of slumber to try and conquer the world. Now, Brave Raideen has a number of original developments in the history of Mecha that bear noting. <clears throat> To begin with, Brave Raideen was the first mecha anime to give mythical origins to its robot. Giant robots up until this point had been metal warriors produced with the advent of technological development in the modern world. Raideen, in contrast, was said to be created thousands of years prior to its set time period by the ancient civilization on the lost continent of Mu. The next development was with the Kira's method of piloting Raideen. As an astroganger before it, Akira would merge into the robot via beam of light. But importantly, he was transported to a cockpit where he controlled Raideen more like modern mecha, such as Mazinger Z or Getter Robo. This enabled the show to play on the mystical robot concept, while at the same time tapping into the trend of piloted robots that had proven so successful in the previous years. The final two developments we want to take note with Brave Raideen are inexorably linked to one another. This all centers around Raideen being birth, uh, both first the, uh, own, sorry, the first anime original mecha show and the first one to feature a transformable robot. As is so often the case when it comes to mecha anime, that connecting factor is with toys. While shows like Mazinger and Z and Getter Robo had been wildly successful in their toy sales, companies were looking for even closer links between what children saw on the screen and the features in their playthings. More abstract weapons like beams or the seemingly magical transformation from machine to robot seen in Get a Robo were impossible to replicate with toys. It was at this point though that toy companies looked to help ensure animated toy synergy by also helping to develop the giant robots from the start rather than leaving it to the animation team. It was to be with Brave Raideen that toy companies took their first stab at being involved in this wholly new way. In order to mitigate the issue of having to conform to a pre-existing property with established robots, Brave Riding was created from the ground up as an original production. When it came to designing the titular robot, the lead was taken by Katsushi Murakami, a trained industrial engineer who had been paramount to the success of the Chogokin toy line. He oversaw the development of Riding's robot to ensure that Riding itself could also transform, transform into its god bird form in a way that could be mimicked by the corresponding toy. When all the pieces came together, Brave Raideen presented children with a new show featuring ideas never before seen in giant robot anime, along with a corresponding toy of unrivaled detail and playability. <clears throat> this type of from the ground up production work would become a feature of mecha anime from here onwards. 
But Braid Riding also gives us a good opportunity to discuss an important trend in storytelling seen in mecha anime of the latter half of the 70s. With toy companies so integrally involved with these anime, it was paramount that each episode featured the titular robot coming out and successfully vanquishing some sort of monstrous foe. This in and of itself wasn't new, but beginning with shows like Brave Rideen, as long as this villain of the week arc was present in each episode, what the creative staff did with the remainder of the story was largely left alone. This meant that stories could become more complex with melodrama, backstory, and unexpected twists, which had previously been minimal in mecha anime. After Brave Rideen, this liberalizing trend in mecha anime would correspond with continued advancements in the realm of toy development, alongside an incredible boom in the output of mecha anime producers. In 1976 alone, using our parameters, 11 different mecha anime premiered, followed by seven in 1977, and settling to a mere four in 1978. But along the way, while there were very few firsts left to have, so to speak, things continued to march ever onward for mecha anime. First in what would become known as the Robot Romance Trilogy would premiere in 1976 with Super Electromagnetic Robo Combatler V. This set of series were produced by Toei Animation and animated by the company eventually to be known as Sunrise, and they're remembered for developments in both the realm of toys and of story. The five vehicle combatler V robot was the first combining robot to get really close to matching what kids could see on screen to the toys that their parents bought them. The second series in the robot romance trilogy, Super Electromagnetic Machine Volts 5, would finally perfect this synergy the following year, with toys of its signature Volts 5 robot having their vehicle transformation and combination on screen matched directly with the toys that kids could buy. <clears throat> But beyond toys, the Robot Romance Trilogy would also be remembered for building upon the freedom of storytelling pioneered by shows like Brave Riding. While the Monster of the Week format remained, the first two entries in this trilogy brought antagonists to the forefront as proper characters as opposed to simple caricatures. Uh, Prince Heinel, the antagonist of Volts 5, for example, was so popular with female fans that they wrote in demanding that they spare him the typical end of series death associated with villains. And the final part of the trilogy, Tosho Daimos, played up the melodrama with a story featuring a Romeo Juliet plot between the main robot pilot and an enemy princess, while still maintaining the necessary amount of robot smashing goodness that the sponsors demanded. But these innovations seen in the Robot Romance trilogy were not the final step for mecha anime in the 70s. The gradual work from Brave Riding through the trilogy had worked to bring robot anime out from the dregs of artistic discourse as mere 30 minute toy advertisements to something that could stand on their own narrative. But anime was maturing in a new way by the end of the 70s. The catalyst for this was the birth of what could really be called the first true anime fandom. Now, there is no single event that really served to move anime from the realm of purely children's entertainment to a diverse medium that could cater to everyone from kids through teens and young adults, but the late 70s featured some key moments. The success of the Space Battleship Yamato compilation film showcased a lot of interest in anime by teens and young adults in a way that hadn't been fully comprehended before. Additionally, 1977 and 78 would see the first publications of dedicated magazines that served to connect fans more deeply with anime as an art form. But both of these instances really just served to reveal the hard truth, that some fans of anime were not dropping it once they reached junior high school, as was the cultural expectation at the time. Instead, they were remaining fans and continuing to consume content as it came out. And just as has been the trend with animation across the world, as fans continue to remain interested beyond childhood, their potential purchasing power begins to shift the narrative structure and themes to more mature levels. In Japan in particular, these older fans who grew up with anime were riding the wave of interest in sci-fi of the late 70s. And mecha anime, with their core set in the futuristic realm of giant robotic weapons, was a natural place for them to turn. So as this emerging breed of fans looked out over the landscape of mecha anime, they would eventually be met head on by one of the most innovative giant robot cartoons of the late 70s. 
Invincible Superman Zambot 3. Now, premiering on October 8, 1977, Zambot 3 represented the first work crafted by an independent Nippon Sunrise in league with the Clover Toy Company. Zambot 3 itself tells the story of the Jean family, the descendants of alien refugees from the planet Baal. After spending a century on Earth in peace, the menacing Gaizoku begin attacking Earth, and the genes must resurrect their family heirlooms, a set of three ships, and the combining giant robot Zambot 3, in order to save the planet. Now, if you didn't know any better at the time, the premise for Zambot 3 wouldn't raise any eyebrows. Aliens defending Earth from the same bad guys who had hurt them was something already established within the mecha anime genre at this point. What Zambot 3 had going for it, however, was the vision of its director, Yoshiyuki Tomino. Tomino presented the struggle to save Earth in a new way. Yes, there was still the hero robot and a weekly bad guy to face off against, but instead of all the wanton destruction and loss of life implied in these battles being forgotten by the end of each episode, Tomino crafted a story where the brutal reality stayed front and center at all times. There were no cheers of support for the Jean family, but instead they were blamed for being the reason that the guys of who were attacking in the first place. And many of the plot points of the episodes center on the PTSD-ridden refugees of the previous episode's battle trying to find a safe place to rebuild. This all culminated in what would become a notorious final arc that saw nearly every main character, save the lead boy pilot, perish as they finally end the guys of who threat. This rapid and near total of the main cast would earn Tomino that famous nickname Kill em All, and it left fans of the show stunned. It's not the characters hadn't been lost before in giant robot anime, see Get a Robo for instance, but the level of tragic occurrence in Zambot 3 far outweighed anything previous. But Tomino and Sunrise had, despite all these darker thematic elements, stuck to the villain of the week style along with a colorful combining robot to help push toy sales. When Tomino got his next shot, though, the result would be a series that would eventually shake the foundations of mecha anime to its core and become one of anime's defining franchises. This series would premiere April 7th, 1979, and was called Mobile Suit Gundam. Set in mankind's distant future in a timeline known as the Universal Century, Mobile Suit Gundam tells the story of a rebellious nation of space colonists known as the Principality of Xeon that use their superior mobile suit weapons to attempt to defeat the Earth Federation and conquer the entirety of the Earth's sphere. Seven months into the war on a remote space colony, the Federation's first mobile suits and their carrier ship come under attack by Xeon forcing a teenager, Amuro Ray, to pilot the prototype combat mobile suit Gundam and become integral to the fate of the entire war. Now, it is hard to describe Gundam merely in terms of firsts because of just how much its narrative uprooted the previous 16 years of giant robot tradition. 
Tomino set out to tell a different story than other mecha shows and began with fundamentally changing the way the series dealt with its giant robots. Robots and Gundam were not even robots anymore. They were mobile suits, a change inspired by the American sci-fi novel Starship Troopers. Additionally, there was no special designation for the villainous robots. They were merely the mobile suits of the bad guys. The same in concept, just built differently. Along with this, most enemies weren't one-off unique creations seen for an episode or two, but rather mass-produced on an industrial scale. Coupled with this was the fact that Tomino bound his mobile suits by physics and introduced believable pseudoscience to make their existence more realistic than before. Robots in Gundam, for example, were only viable fighting vehicles because of special radar-blocking Minoski particles, and these same particles were the entire foundation for the Gundam special beam weapon. In addition to this, Gundam's mobile suits were not just recognized by their cool names, but they were carefully crafted by governmental powers with associated model numbers and variants to distinguish between versions, just like with real military hardware. Even the more mystical elements of Gundam in the form of the new type phenomenon was played off as a natural pattern of evolution according to the show's internal logic. When you couple all of these in-universe details with the notion that Gundam would, for the first time in Mecha's history, pit two human nations against one another in war, and you begin to see just how starkly different it was from its predecessors. This difference would forever create a schism in Mecha anime. From now on, shows in the vein of Gundam's predecessors would become called super robot mecha sh shows, and series that played ball with Gundam's new take on things would be real robot shows. Now, if you had to qualify the differences between super and real robot anime, they would roughly be as follows. Super robot anime are essentially gigantic metal superhero shows. The robots are awesome, and that awesomeness springs from some sort of power source, material, legacy, um, that's usually stated, but rarely explained beyond necessity. The weapons they wield usually emphasize creativity and spectacle, often seeming to be purely magical in quality with the ability to get stronger as needed. And finally, these robots are more often than not crafted by a singular weirdo or genius and piloted by youthful protagonists against mystical or alien invaders. On the opposite end of that spectrum, real robot anime are more often akin to war films. Robots in these shows are often, you know, awesome as well, but their awesomeness is possibly plausible and based on a realistic sense of science fiction and sometimes kind of a uh, fantasy element as well. The weapons of these robots tend to be upsized versions of familiar human weapons, plus being susceptible to things like running out of ammunition or a battlefield wear and tear. And lastly, these mecha are rarely, if ever, creations of eccentrics or mad scientists, but rather constructed by governments or apolitical organizations, though that whole, like, kids piloting bit is still pretty popular, we do admit. So Gundam's mere presence would be a catalyst for change on an unprecedented scale. But was that change immediately visible to animation fans of the late 70s? The answer here is a categorical no. Gundam's history in the 70s is that of failure. The show's primary sponsor, the Clover Toy Company, had ensured that the titular robots were brightly colored to attract the gaze of children and had even been integral to one of the show's main features, the core block system. This in the show is the core block system means that in the event of catastrophic damage, the pilot can eject out of the robot in a small jet fighter to save valuable combat data. For Clover, this system meant that three main robot toys could become nine different options to play with for kids. The problem was that Tomino wasn't as interested in playing to the whims of the toy company, or pretty much anyone for that matter. While the Gundam and other protagonist mobile suit did come out each episode, they never used these interchangeable designs as hoped, and even when later transforming support vehicles were added, they weren't enough to save things. Gundam, you see, was only pulling in measly 5% ratings in its time slot, and the toys weren't pulling in sustainable numbers, so Clover canceled its partnership, dooming the production. In the end, Gundam would end up being cut to 43 episodes from the originally intended 52. From here on, the thought was that Gundam would go the way like sh of shows like Astro Ganger and Zero Tester and become nothing more than a relic of the past. 
And this is where we are forced to leave off as the 80s are on the horizon. Mecca is here to stay, but innovations to the system such as Mobile Suit Gundam appear to be teetering on the brink of collapse with no clear future in sight. As we've looked back at mecha anime between these two decades, what we've seen is its meteoric rise from just one of a number of anime competitors to its own unique genre. And it's not just any genre. Uh, by the end of our time period, mecha anime is an established fixture in the anime world with over 40 separate shows, shorts, and films to its name. Even then, as we've seen, giant robot anime wasn't a static rinse and repeat affair. As anime evolved, so too did mecha anime, especially as it became inexorably tied to the economic miracle of post-war Japan through the lens of the toy industry. This link, while sometimes stifling, was also a force for innovation and narrative. But with the coalescing of organized anime fandom and the aging of its audiences in the waning years of the decade, so too would mecha anime begin to slowly mature. The subsequent decade of the 1980s would see Japan continue its rise to international economic dominance, and as we'll see next time, mecha anime would burst forth into what many consider to be its golden age. All right, and that will do us for the day. Uh, just a thing to note to everyone, um, sometime later today, I'm hoping to get it posted on the Tumblr page. We are going to be putting a list for you of all the shows mentioned in the panel plus the full list essentially that we created where essentially shows that fit our different parameters that we've put in. So we have a couple of minutes. So if anyone has any questions, uh, we have the Twitch stream up here. So if someone wants to pose a question, we'd be more than happy to answer some. Cool. I, uh, either if you want to read the chat yourself or I can uh, read them out loud to you, which, whichever one you want to do. Uh, I can, I'm, I finally have it up this time. So, <laughs> okay. I'll let you take the lead then. All righty. Uh, I guess the first one, when's next time we, we have made and aired our, uh, second panel on the eighties. Uh, we just, you know, we only had a couple of panel slots here, so we only ended up doing this one. Um, let's see which mecha is our favorite. I mean, for both of us, we're Gundam fans. That's what got us into it. So that's hands down, at least for me. I don't know. What about my co-panelists? Any different? Gundam. Yeah, it's Gundam. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. Any other questions? What made Char so popular? Well, and that's the thing. So like we kind of noted with the Robot Romance trilogy, so there is a lot of inherent popularity with these kind of like suave, debonair kind of bad guys. Um, and when you have Gundam, one of the things that Tomino liked the idea of is you don't have X is bad guy, Y is good guy kind of feel. So you have that combination of a really, you know, like I said, the interesting character design, good story to him. And it's, you know, uh, how would you put it? It's, it's oblique, it's not kind of a clear cut thing. So you have much more of an opportunity. And then when you get into things later on, like with Gundam Wing, importantly, they weren't planning on originally having uh, Zex Marquis have a mask, but they added it to it and it just kind of became a thing from there and it's really never stopped. Let's see. Which mecha should be? I see a which mecha anime from the seven, from this time should get a remake. Um, we'll see Zambots. Yeah, I to I would totally. Yeah, we would love to see like Zambot three remade for the modern day. Like, there's so much dark and grisly anime, so <laughs> uh, that would be a fun one to see nowadays. Um, I see a question. Uh, we don't have the eighties one online. We have the equipment now. So we're hoping to start getting some of these online to a YouTube channel. So that'll be coming as soon as we can get things in place. Uh, it's going down the line. Okay. Are there any other shows that would have been worth mentioning? Um, and was it invincible steel man die Tarn three. That would have been that. For example, that would have been the one that we would have included if we could have. Uh, any others? That's the that's the one that comes to mind at least. I mean, it's not like Getter Robo G or like a sequel or something like that. Now let's see. Um, Robo Robo Grandizer. 
One second, I'm gonna make the some of the stuff is off the screen. All right. Yes, there. I see a question about essentially were there other lesser known mecha manga from the early sixty from the sixties or early seventies. Uh, I know there were others. It's not like, you know, it's kind of nowadays, not every single one that's made into an anime. Uh, we didn't really dip into them, but I've seen, for example, when you see the lists of giant robot manga, you definitely see ones that they don't match up to associated anime. So there must be more. I, I just wish, unfortunately, I couldn't give you much more on it. Okay. So uh, uh, that does take us to the top of the hour. Um, oh, I see it here. We're, uh, where can oh you've got your contact information up so if people have additional questions they can contact you it looks like on facebook twitter or on your tumblr page um i don't know if you've been in the discord but a, a lot of the panelists have also been in there answering questions yeah we haven't been hanging out in it but uh i mean for if people really want you know feel free and post in here we i can check the discord in a little bit to see if there are any questions additional questions that i can ask but uh, oh one little thing i guess when I put up the 60s list, I'm also going to be putting up our 80s list at the same time. Just to, So there will be two posts that will have this panel and the other panel we didn't get to present. And eventually we're going to be doing 90s and 2000s. We're working on the 90s one right now. Cool. Well, uh, with that, I'm going to take us to break. Uh, thank you mo so much for joining us.